All right, we have been in this this series, uh, which has just simply been a verse by verse study of the book of Philippians. And today, tonight, uh, we are in the topic, uh, the joy of the local church part four. The joy of the local church part four. Uh, for the last several weeks, we've been looking at this letter that the apostle Paul had written to this ancient church in Philippi. It had been about two years um, since uh, he, uh, they say they've corresponded with one another. Many theologians suggest about two years. He had been in prison for, for two years. And now some kind of way uh, that church at Philippi had gotten word that the Apostle Paul was in prison in Rome. And because they loved the Apostle Paul so deeply, and it was a mutual love, as we've been talking about this series, it's not just pastor to church, but it's also church to pastor, um, that they love this man of God. And this man of God loves this assembly of believers. Some kind of way they found out where Paul was, and they sent this individual by the name of Ephroditus uh, to the Apostle Paul to be able to minister to him. They ministered to him in two ways. The first way was to check on him, to see how he was doing, um, to be there as a companion with him as it were, but also they gave um, Paul an offering. See, it's, it's something about checking on somebody. Uh, you can make them, I feel a lot better when you put something in my hand. You know, I feel a lot, feel a lot, <laughs> I feel a lot better whenever that you're checking on somebody, looking after somebody. Uh, they, they sent the Apostle Paul not only encouragement, but they also sent the Apostle Paul um, an offering, which he's going to talk about at the tail end of this letter. This is where we get that bold declaration that my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. That is a response to what it is that the church at Philippi had did for him. And so here, this letter literally that we've been walking through and looking at has been a response. Again, the, the church at Philippi sought out their leader. They sought out the apostle Paul to try to figure out what was going on with him. They found out he was in prison and then they sent Ephrodite to be there to be a companion with them and also to give him an offering. Now Paul is writing back to them, letting them know that he is good. Let Letting them know that there is still the joy of the Lord that's in his heart and there's a joy of the Lord that is that he's walking in and living in and abiding and he's really telling this church don't worry about me we've talked about on last week let me just kind of set the context so you can so you can be able to be where we are this week uh, we've talked about in that Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 was probably one of the one of the most popular verses other than my God shall supply is it is that verse of scripture said that that being confident in this very thing the one that have began this work and here we discuss on last week that the joy of the local church can be experienced through finishing through finishing in other words that what it is that God had begun whatever it is that God has started he's going to bring it to completion he's going to bring it to perfection he's going to bring it to maturity and that gives us good news to let us know that God is not a half-hearted God he don't bring us halfway but God brings us totally and completely to victory and we also discuss that the joy of the local church can be experienced through knowing uh, what is in your pastor's possession again this is a love letter as it were from the apostle to the church at Philip from the church of Philippi to the apostle and Paul said in verse number seven I don't got time to re-preach you got to go back and listen to it Paul said I hold you in my heart he says, I'm holding you in my heart. I love you. I'm possessing you. It's all right for me to feel this way about you because you're in my heart. So whatever I'm going to tell you, I'm not trying to tell you to hurt you. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm not trying to make you angry or upset, but I'm just trying to tell you what's best for you because I love you is what the apostle Paul said. Then we discussed that the joy of the local church can be experienced through knowing that we are partakers in suffering. So not just in the blessings and the name and the claim and the blab and the grace the call and holler. We love being partakers of that, but we are partakers in suffering. We suffer together. We, we serve together. We love one another together, and ultimately, we're going to reign together. And then we also discuss, because of the fact that we're partners in this, the mere fact that we go through life together, and that's just not talking about the ups, that's just not talking about the blessings, but also we go through difficult times together. Love is evidence of salvation. Anybody remember that? Love is evidence of salvation, meaning you can't say you love the Lord and then you don't love your neighbor. You can't say that God is your source and your strength, but then you, you treat people any kind of way. It is evidence, as the Apostle Paul says, it's evidence that we are in the family of God because we love one another. This is just all review, just trying to bring you up some context so we can be able to continue to move forward. The joy of the local church 
uh, can be experienced through intercession. So Paul is exemplifying. He's showing us how we ought to pray for one another. He's interceding for them and they're praying for him. The joy of the local church can be experienced through overflowing love. So he said, I want the love that God has given you that it may abound more and more. And that ought to be our prayer, especially if you are not a people person, especially if you don't do people or like people. Come on, God has already given us love, but we ought to pray that God gives us even more more love and even more love that our love will overflow and overwhelm and be able to get to a place to where we exemplify modeling what love really is and look what this visiting evangelist is we're going to invite him he'll, he'll be here Sunday be the Lord's will look what he said it's easy <laughs> To love people that you don't know. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that something? <laughs> it's easy to love people. He'll be here Sunday. He's going he gonna, to he gonna, he gonna share the word of the Lord. Can I tell you, it's easy to say we love. Oh, I love the world. I, I love this person. I love that person. It's easy to love people you don't know. But it's when you start rubbing elbows with folk. It's when you start to get to know them. It's, start when, it's when you start seeing their idiosyncrasies. It's whenever it is you start seeing all their little funnies and their little habits and their little attitudes. And now it's a little more difficult for us to say that we love somebody. But that's what real love is about the joy of the local church can be experienced through intimacy so Paul said not only should we get to know one another we ought to get to know God and when we spend time with God we'll know what it is that God desires for us to be able to do the joy of the local church can be experienced through insight uh, so Paul continued to pray for this church. And this is where we are. We're walking through his prayer for this church. He continued to pray that God would give them insight. That God will give them revelation. That God would give them knowledge. So not just so they can be satisfied with being saved. But also they can be able to govern themselves accordingly to the kingdom of God. It's the sons of Issachar that the scripture says that the sons of Issachar knew what time it was. They knew, understood the times. And not only did they understand the times. They knew what they ought to do. The joy of the local church can be experienced through examination. So he said, just don't be willy-nilly just be in relationship with anybody, but no, our love needs to be pure. It needs to be approved. It needs to be tested. It needs to be scrutinized. And here, finally, last one from last week, it's just simply this, the love, the joy, rather, of the local church can be experienced through knowing the end goal. Knowing the end goal, that's what we found in verse number 11. And we said everything that we're doing, we ought to be producing fruit. We ought to have fruit of righteousness and it ought to be for the glory and the honor of God. All right, let's get to work. This is this week. Now we're coming into this. these next verses of scripture. Be the Lord's will. We'll go through chapter chapter 1, verse 12 through 18. Be the Lord's will. With my time up, I'm just going to be done and we'll pick it up from there. And we'll just be done for the day. Be the Lord's will. Be the Lord's will. Heavy on the Lord's will there. So so let's, let's go today. All right, today. The, the joy, y'all ready? Yeah. All right, okay. The joy of the, the joy that should be in the local church, look at this, can be extinguished when I allow my circumstances to control me. Here we go. Here we go. Here, here, here the Apostle Paul, I believe that there's a principle in something that he's trying to teach us today that the joy that should be in the local church. And when he says that it, it can be extinguished through allow, when I allow my circumstances to control me. When, when we're talking about the joy of the local church, we're not just talking about the gathering. We're not just talking about what we do on Sundays. We're not just talking about what we're doing on Thursdays. But I believe that we ought to literally do life together. I believe that we ought to, we ought to love one another and be, be the body of Christ. That's what Jesus Christ have have commissioned us to do and told us to do that when people see the way that we love one another then the world will know that God sent his son but we will not be able to get everything out of the local church that is designed to do whenever it is that we allow our circumstances to control us look what Paul said in, in, in Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 he said I want you to know is I want y'all to know something he said brothers that what has happened to me. Come on, that, that, that's loaded, y'all. That's loaded. The Apostle Paul said, I want y'all to know something. He literally says, I, I want you to know about my journey. I want you to know about, I just told you a moment ago that Paul is in prison in Rome. And Paul is saying, I want you to know the fact that I'm a prisoner. You, you want to know. I told you there was a reason why this church was, was trying to catch up with Paul. They were trying to see how he was doing. They were trying to see, was he all right? And so now Paul, I told you this letter is a response in their inquiry. They want to know how you're doing. 
So Paul said, here it is. Thank you for sending Ephroditus. Thank you for sending that gift. But I want you to know. I want you to know what's going on to me. Literally, the apostle Paul is in prison. Literally, he's chained to a soldier. We'll unpack that a little further. Paul is in a very difficult situation. He's in a very difficult circumstance. And he's saying to them, I need you to know my whereabouts. Know my affairs. What's really going on with me? Oh, I love this about the apostle Paul. Look at, look at Ephesians chapter 6 verse 21 because he did in this letter as well. So that you also may what? May know how I am and what I'm doing. So Paul says, I want you to know how I am. He says to the church at, at Ephesus. But look, he didn't stop there. Look what he says in Colossians. And chapter 4, verse 7 says, Tychus will tell you, uh, uh, tell you all about what? My activity. So the apostle Paul is saying, I want you to know how I'm doing. Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that we so saved and so deep that oftentimes we neglect even even to stop the pause for the calls for a second to kind of see how we're doing. Hey, I love this about the possible. I know that's not deep. I know that's not something you want. To, you're not going to do a cartwheel on that. But can I tell you that here, so oftentimes we've gotten so, we've gotten so consumed with doing ministry and doing life that we don't take time to check on ourselves. We don't take time to be honest with our situation. Look what the Apostle Paul is saying. Paul is saying that this letter is about joy. This letter is about what it is that God is desiring to do in and through the Apostle Paul. He has joy. But you cannot, you cannot overlook the circumstances. To overlook the circumstances is to be foolish. To overlook the circumstances is not to be honest with what's going on. You don't have to, you don't have to worship the circumstances and here my point is don't allow the circumstances to control you but at least acknowledge the circumstances acknowledge what's going on it's not a, it's a, it does not say you're not a person of faith it's not saying you don't believe God no if you're tired come on you're tired come on if you if you got a lot of pressure right now you got a lot of pressure right now come on if you feel like that you, you, you're just a little overwhelmed right now you feel like you're a little overwhelmed but I should not allow how I'm feeling or allow my predicament or my circumstances to control me what, what am I trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you that God is not intimidated with your circumstances. God is not intimidated about how you feel. God is not intimidated with our emotions. He wants us to be honest with him about our feelings and our emotions, but we got to leave them with him. The scripture says cast. Literally, it's to hurl our cares onto him because he cares for us. It's not a problem with me telling God what's going on. The problem is when I'm allowing what's going on to dictate how I deal with God. And Paul said, let me let you know how I'm doing. So let me ask you a question. Let me get up in your business for a second. How, how are you doing? <laughs> oh, come on here. I know you say sanctified and Kentucky fried, but can I ask you how you doing for real though? Can I ask you how you doing? Come on. I know you love the Lord all your heart, mind, soul, spirit, and understand it, but how are you doing? Come on. You, we can be so busy praying for other folk that we don't pray for ourselves. We can be so busy pouring out that we don't get the opportunity to pour in. We can be so busy doing what we need to do that we don't take a moment to be able to check on ourselves. And the Apostle Paul is teaching us something here that he I can be in the Philippian jail and I'm telling you I'm in a horrible situation but this situation is not controlling my life but Paul said I want you to know I want you to know what's going on that that don't resonate with about two or three votes but it's the truth anyway can I tell you to hear how we need to know how we're doing how we're doing every now and then you got to do a self check and see and see what's going on with you in your heart and in your mind but Paul is talking to these folks he is close with them he calls them brethren which is a term of endearment. He said, y'all are, y'all are my brothers. We're in the family of God together. And this is what the enemy tries to do. The enemy tries to extinguish our joy by our circumstances. But Paul said, no, I'm not going to allow my circumstances. My circumstances are what they are. I'm waiting literally to appear before the Supreme Court in Rome. I'm facing trial. I'm, I'm probably going to lose my head. My life is about to be over. Paul is literally telling them what's going on. He's waiting waiting on all of these individuals who have it out for him just to be able to come and petition his death and to be able to say that this brother needs to be executed. He needs to be put to death. But Paul is saying regardless of what it is that I'm going through, regardless of what it is I'm facing, I still have my joy. This is a letter about joy. And Paul is saying I still got my joy no matter what it is that I'm facing. But I've learned in our day and time, we let everything bother our joy. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm, I'm, lear I'm learning if we let everything bother our joy. And then sometimes, let me deal with this low-hanging fruit, and then we'll deal with some other things. We don't like dealing with this first one. I deal with this, and I'm going on about my business. Hey, come on, can you share? Can you share before you go? Just before you go, go on and share real quick. Can I, can I tell you that, 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 that oftentimes our joy is distinguished because of unrepented sin in our lives? Nothing steals your joy like perpetual sin. God Almighty, <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I tell you, can I tell you, if you're a child of God, if you're a child of God for real though, and you're, and you're practicing sin, and you're habitually practicing sin, can I tell you that God, you know that God is not pleased with that, and your spirit is not pleased with that. Come on, you can try to, you can try to push it down and act like it doesn't bother you, but that bothers you, it will steal your joy, unrepentant sin. Come on, I've been, I've been talking to folk before, but we, you know, we can't, we can't pass it away. Uh, folk used to pass it back in the day. You be wanting to tell them, you know, you just need to repent. You just need to get your heart right. You just need to come out of sin. Come on, honey. anybody ever? Anybody ever? Anybody just want to say, just say, just say, you know, you know exactly what's going on with them. They, we can skirt around this all day. We can act. We can dance around this all day and ask all these questions and say all these pretty prayers. But we every now and then you gotta say, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. When you're a child of God, dissatisfaction will always be the order of the day. When you're a child of God, bitterness will always be the order of the day. When you're practicing her habitual sin, doubt and fear and negativism will, will mark your life whenever it is that we're harboring sin. I'm not preaching a gospel of perfection. I'm just saying that here we, we cannot be children of God and then be knowingly sinning and knowingly doing things that we know that's living beneath God's, God's will and God's way and God's word. And can I tell you, that's a clear indication that your joy is gone. Maybe if you don't have any joy, you listen to me right now, you're in this room right now, and here you don't have any joy when you think about your relationship with God. Maybe, just maybe, there's something that we need to repent about. Maybe, just maybe, there's something we got to get out of our heart. Oh, but my friend, the Apostle Paul says we, 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 we ought to have some joy. God has given us joy. God has given us something down in our hearts and in our minds that we can't let trouble snatch away from us. We can't let sin snatch away from us. We can't let accidents and incidents and failures and financial loss and divorce and bankruptcy. We cannot allow these things to snatch our joy and rejection. Come on, we can name it on and on to the break of dawn. We cannot allow these things to get us to a place to where we don't have our joy. I love studying the Apostle Paul because no matter what he was going through, he was literally in prison but Paul did not grumble. Paul did not complain. Paul did not question God and wonder why he was going through what he was going through. Pa Paul did not murmur. Paul was not all falling in the pieces. Paul did not walk away from the faith, but Paul understood that what he was going through, it was a purpose. What is pastor trying to tell you today? I'm trying to tell you there is nothing wrong with having negative circumstances in our life. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging those negative circumstances, but I should not allow those negative circumstances to control me. Is there anybody in here? Is there anybody watching me online that's made up in your mind? You're not going to allow what's around you to control your joy, to control your mood, to control your attitude but you made up in your mind you're still going to have some joy. Paul said if my joy, listen to me closely, Paul said if my joy was related to my circumstances I wouldn't have any joy. Paul said if my joy was based on my pleasures here on earth I wouldn't have any joy. Paul said if my joy was based on my possessions I wouldn't have any joy. If joy was based on my freedom I wouldn't have any joy. If joy was based on my prestige I wouldn't have any joy but my joy has nothing to do with any of that but it has everything to do with the one that I'm in relationship with I still got my joy come on type down the screen I still got my I still got my joy that, that, this, 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 is, this, is, this is simple but can I tell you this, this is the point to where, to where many of us miss it because we allow so many things to snatch our joy and look what this evangelist is going he's going to be here on, on, on third Sunday this guy here we're going to invite him third Sunday look he'll be here look what it says here my, my, my spiritual maturity <laughs> can always be evaluated by what I allow to steal my joy you want to know how mature you are in the things of God what rattles your cage <laughs> you, you want to know how much joy you have? You want to know how much how mature you are? Rather, look at the circumstance. Think about I, when, I, when I was typing this. Come on, this, this type real smooth when you want to type it. 
But then it don't type it smooth when you want to live it. Come on, talk to me right here. Come on, think back. Think, think back the last time you got all out of sorts. Think about the last time you were just all, all uh, played out of pocket. You just, you just was acting out of character. Just say, when the last time somebody come out and pulled your number? When was the last time somebody pressed the wrong button? When was the long time you, last time you said something you didn't want to say? Think about that time. And here can I tell you, when we think about that time and think about that, that set of circumstances and think about what was going on around that time, that is God. God letting us know that we're not as far down the road as we think we are. That's God letting us know that you got to go back to the drawing board. We're not going to throw the baby out with the bad water, but you can't think you missed much as such it. You can't think you missed the deep. No, you got some still some areas in your life. Oh my goodness. Are y'all going to do me like this on a Thursday through the word? Is there anybody other than me that know you still got some areas in your life? They here, they catch you on the wrong day at the wrong time. Come on here. You didn't eat your breakfast. Come on here. You, you didn't have your coffee. Lord have mercy. Can I tell you, they, they, might, they might get some that you didn't want to give her. Oh, don't y'all look at me like that in that tone of voice. I'm looking for somebody that'll know that here, whenever I allow myself to get played out of pocket, that's share, they're showing me, that's God showing me an area of immaturity in my life. All of us have areas that we need to mature. I got to, I got to see what is that thing that's still in my joy. Is it financial struggles that's causing you to steal, is causing your joy to be stolen? Is it what people are doing around you that's causing your joy to be stolen? Is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it political figures? Is it this? Is that? We can go on and on. Whatever that area is, that's the area I need to hone in. I need to ask God to help me. But here, here this is what the Apostle Paul exemplified and showed us something. Let me help you. Let me help you because here, let me, these three things. Let me give you these three things as we, as we move forward. Here, we, we conquer circumstances through Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to say amen to that. We, well, I said we, we conquer circumstances through Jesus Christ. So my circumstances don't control me. I control my circumstances. I conquer my circumstances. I don't allow what my circumstances are to control me. But no, we conquer our circumstances through Jesus Christ. Secondarily, we, we, are, not, we are not the victim of circumstances. We are the conquerors of circumstances through Jesus Christ. So I got to change the narrative. I got to change how I think. Think about what it is that I'm going through. Come on, it's on the screen. We are not the victim of circumstance. I'm not allowing my, my situations to victimize me. I'm not allowing my situation to pull me back and pull me down. I, I'm not allowing. I don't, I don't care. I don't care. Maybe you can trace it all the way back to your childhood. Maybe you can trace it all the way back to when you're, before you even got here. You can chase it back to this person did you wrong and that person did you wrong and this happened and that happened. I'm not a victim based off my circumstance. And no, when I'm in Christ, I am a victor. My my friend. In fact, all I do is win. And because of my circumstances, how difficult they are, how bad they are, I'm not a victim to my circumstances, but no, I'm more than a conqueror. See, we don't like this kind of preaching because we like being victim. We don't like this kind of preaching because we always want to talk about what mom and them did. We always talk about what the white man did, what the black man did, what the orange man did, what the green man did. Oh, we always want to talk about what this person did and what he said, that she said, that I thought that I heard that they didn't do this and they didn't say that. We love being a victim, but I'm not a victim. No, I'm a victim. Victor. And here you may have said that. You may have did that. That thing did hurt. It did sting. I did cry. I'm not telling that lie no more. Talking about sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words will never hurt. Your words do hurt. Your words sting. I'd rather you hit me with a stick every now and then than to say some of the stuff you say. I'd rather you hit me cross it. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. I'd rather you jug me once or twice. But some of the words that people say, those things are resonating in your heart and resonating in your mind. And you may have said it. It did hurt. I did cry. I was hurt. But what you did but I am not a victim to what you did but I am a victor of what it is that God has allowed to happen to me I still got my joy oh let me tell you here look at this third thing we are not to allow our circumstances to discourage others we're gonna unpack this further as we go I'm not supposed to be just going through any kind of way because somebody is watching me and, and, and someone is, someone, good God, there's some pressure, but this is how God has done it. Somebody is measuring their spirituality by my maturity. I'm out of here. Hey, I don't want to. I'm, I'm going to get out of here. Let me, let me go. Let me, let me get out of here. <laughs> like I didn't say nothing. Just that. I just said something so good. Look at me like I didn't say nothing. I'm trying to tell you that somebody is judging their spirituality based off my maturity. Based off how I respond to a trial, how I respond to a slight, how I respond to something happening to me, they're basing their next move off of my last move. 
Lord, so I'm not just supposed to go through no any kind of way. We ought to use our circumstances to encourage others and to get God some glory. That's what we go through. Lord, I just don't go through to go through. I go through to get God some glory. I love that movie. I love that movie, The 300. Lord, have mercy. I'm going to have to watch it. I'm going to have to watch it on the Monday coming. You, I watch movies on Monday now. Come on. On Monday, I wind down. On Monday, I cut my phone off. I watch some TV, watch some movies, watch some sports. I catch up on some stuff. And I, on my Monday, on my Monday, y'all ain't gonna talk, man. That's what somebody say Monday. They don't say Monday. Say Monday. On my Monday, I, I'm gonna watch me 300 because I love it. They they was fighting and they was insurmountable odds and everybody was coming up against them. They they came in their little huddle. They were looking around and they said, you know what? We can't win, but you know what we fight. We fight for glory. Lord, have mercy. I say, boy, you better preach. That's some preaching. They say we we fight for glory. What we're going through, there's no way we can win. We're surrounded. A whole entire nation was coming toward them and say we're not going to tuck our tails we're not going to run we're not going to hide we're going to fight and we're going to fight for some glory now I know a Leonardus or whatever his name was if he can fight for Athens or for Greece to be able to get them some glory how much more can I deal with this nasty person in my family how much more can I deal with this situation I don't want to be in and you know what I'm fighting for I fight for glory I'm going through because I'm trying to give God some <laughs> Uh, some glory. I got to run here. Look what the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and 24. This ought to be our mindset. He said, but I do not count my life. I don't count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. Is that still in your Bible? That's it. Still there. The Apostle said, this is how I go through what I'm going through. I don't, it's not about me is what Paul is saying. He said, if only I may finish my course. And the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said it's not about what I want to do and how I want to do it. Whatever God has allowed me to go through, I'm going to go through it. I'm going to finish my course and I'm going to get God some, some, some glory. So can I tell you that we won't experience the joy that God desires for us to have in the local church whenever it is that I allow my circumstances to control me. But look, let's look at something else. The, the joy of the local church. Can, all, can only be experienced through my continuing. Mm -hmm. Paul said, the thing that happened to me. What had happened, Paul? Something happened to all of us. Paul said, the thing that happened to me, the thing that happened, I'm in prison, I'm, I'm in jail, I'm locked up, but I, I can't, I, I got some difficult circumstances. The thing that happened to me, I don't know what happened to you, but all of us got a, what had happened was. All of us got something that happened to us, but Paul said, the thing that happened to me he, he goes on to say in that same verse has really served, look at it, to advance the gospel. He said the thing that happened to me has served to advance the gospel. In other words, the thing that happened to me, come on, it's right there, y'all, didn't stop me. The thing that happened to me, God really used it. He says it's really served. It served the purpose to move me forward. <laughs> the thing that happened to him it was initiated and it came his way to destroy him and to stop him but God used that thing to push him ahead oh it'll make it'll make more sense to you let me let me tell you what advanced mean then let me let, let me let you see what Paul is saying here in the original look at advanced I put it right there on your paper you got it right there on the screen come on look at it you can go back and look at it advanced it simply means to progress gradual improvement or growth or development this is so good. Paul says, it has, it, 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 it has inherent in it the idea that something is moving along in spite of obstacles, danger, and distraction. Look how pregnant that one word is. Paul, Paul, Paul is saying, the thing that happened to me, all of us got something that's happened to us. You may not be locked up in a, in a jail in Rome like Paul, but you got something to happen to you. And Paul said, the thing that has happened to me, it is serving me and it served God's purposes to advance the, advance the, the gospel, to advance the cause, to progress, the gradual improvement. In other words, he's saying there's opposition. Paul said, I can keep on growing and developing no matter I have obstacles, dangers, and things trying to stop us. Come on, I'm trying to talk to somebody right now that's always talking about all of the opposition that's always talking about the insurmountable odds that's talking about this mountain talking about that valley talking about this trouble that trial but God is saying I'll let you move forward in spite of that 
Ah, uh, that's all I'm trying to tell you. The Paul said, "I'm moving forward." Let me, let me, let me try to break it down a little, a little further because I, I love this because it, this literally speaks of this same word speaks of an explorer or an army that's making headway. Come on, this is an army that's that's marching, and it's literally speaking of of, of, of an army or an explorer, somebody that's going somewhere they never gone before, and they got to go through the terrain, they, the, the terrain. They got to go through all of the trees, and they got to go through all this stuff, and they're going and they're hacking. Come on, anybody ever seen somebody exploring, going to some uncharted territory, and they don't know where they're going, they don't know what's happening, but they're going through all of the woods, they're going through all of the stuff, but they're going somewhere. They may not be able to go as fast as they would go if there was a highway, if there was a road there. Oh, but no, every now and then, God will take you through some tough times, and God will take you through some high ground, and God will take you through some places that got trees, and some places that got some, some, some overgrown grass, and God is saying to us that you know what you're doing, you're not following down the path of least resistance, anybody just walk down the street that somebody's already paved it, anybody can go down somewhere that somebody's already set the way, but every now and then, God say, no, I want to further you, and you got to be a trailblazer, that's what a trailblazer do, the way I got to be able to do some things in my family that nobody else has ever done. I got to be able to do some things in my life that nobody's ever done before. And I got to be a trailblazer. Paul said to God, let this stuff happen to me so I can be a trailblazer. God said, God, let these Paul said, God, let these things happen to me so I can be able to go further than I've ever been before. I can go deeper than I've ever been before. That I don't got to allow my circumstances and my dilemmas to stop me, but I can be able to keep on going where God want me to go. Lord, have mercy. You would have never start that business if God wouldn't let that happen to you. Come on, you would have never got in that relationship if God had to let that happen to you. And God said, I let that happen to you so you can be able to do and be able to fail and go down that path and be a trailblazer. You are, oh, preach Pastor Corby. I'm trying my best here. Oh, I'm too excited here. I'm, this is how the word do me. I just get excited. I'm sorry, y'all. Can I tell you here? <laughs> Paul says, I got to, I got to blaze this path. I got to blaze any, any, any trailblazer. I got any trailblazers that's watching. I got any trailblazers. Anybody in the house say, Lord, I know, I know, I, I don't, I, I can't figure all this out. I don't know how it's gonna look. I don't know how it's gonna work out. I don't know what's gonna happen. But I'm gonna keep on going because God is advancing me. That's what Paul said. It has served to advance the gospel. The gospel is God's, is God's purpose. This is what it is that God has said. Look what, look what Paul says. Paul says God opens these things for us. God puts us in these postures for us to do his will and get him glory. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 16, 9. It'll make sense to you. Look what he says. He says, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me. Oh, we love that. I should have broke that verse up. So, look, we love that. Oh, God has opened the door. New season. It's a new season. It's a new day. Whatever you're doing in this season, please don't do what I mean. We love, we love all that. Oh, Lord, Lord ain't no, ain't nothing seen this before. Uh, I have not seen, ear have not heard. We love all that. A, a, a wide, effective door. But look what Paul says. And there are many adversaries. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Paul said that God opened a door for me to do his work and do his will. But on the other side of that door, there are many adversaries. Oh, my friend, what am I trying to tell you? You cannot further God's call. You will not be able to further what it is that God has purposed you for if you don't look for some adversaries every now and then. Wherever the most fruit is, you got to know there's some giants in the land. You got to know that there's some adversaries there. There's going to be some, there's going to be some trouble. I love, I love what the message paraphrase said. The same verse of scripture. It says, "A huge door of opportunity for good work has opened up here." Man, we got an opportunity to do some things here. But look what it says. There's also mushrooming opposition. I love that because I, I grew up in a neighborhood. You walk through the neighborhood and, and you and you walk through the neighborhood and the grass look one way and you come out in the morning, it's some mushrooms there. Anybody anybody seen some, some mushrooms that spring up overnight? Come on, don't, don't try to eat them and don't do no other stuff with them. No, that's not that's not for consumption. Come on, that's not that's not for you to be playing around with the with the mushrooms, no. But what am I what am I saying? They, those, those the mushrooms that they, they, they just they just spring up though. They just come up overnight. They, they, you, you, now you see them and now you don't. Or now, now you didn't see them and now they're there. 
And that's how our position is. That's when God opens up a door to do good work. Whenever God downloads something in your spirit, you know what? I'm finna start doing this. You know what? I'm gonna get involved in that. All right, go right ahead. But you got to go with it in with the mindset of knowing that there's gonna be some opposition. When you went started heading that way, you didn't see the opposition. When you started heading that way, you didn't see the trouble. But it's gonna be mushroom, it's gonna pop up out of nowhere. But I can't let the mushroom make me run away. I can't let the mushroom be able to stop me from doing what the God has told me to do. And that's the thing I love about mushrooms. All you gotta do is say, look at the flick of the wrist, look at the flick of the wrist. That's all you gotta do with the mushroom. It just flick them off. Y'all, y'all, I don't got the right, I don't got the right crowd. Y'all don't know that. Look at the flick of the wrist, look at the flick of the uh, Can I tell you, you just, you just, you just, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know that about it. They don't know that. Yeah. I tried. Can I tell you here? I can always count on the media team to know what I'm talking about on that. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you? Mushrooms gonna pop up out of anywhere, anywhere. They're gonna pop up, but you gotta keep on, you gotta keep on going. Let me get me going. Let me go. Let me go. First Thessalonians two two. First Thessalonians two two. We making good ground. Let me. But I'm not gonna finish. Look, First Thessalonians two two. It says, but 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 though, look what he says. But though we had already suffered and had been shamefully treated, where at Philippi, who is he writing to? Philippi. Philippi. <laughs> look what he says. As you know, we had boldness. In our God to declare the gospel of God. Look at this. Despite trouble. Without trouble. It was easy. He said in the midst of much conflict. Lord, what, what am I saying? If you're going to do anything. This is all Pastor John. If you're going to do anything for the kingdom of God. Or you're going to fulfill God's purposes or for your life. There's going to be some conflict. You cannot let the conflict slap the taste out of your mouth so be so shocked the way it caused you not to do what it is that God is doing. How many people are sitting on the sideline because they don't like confrontation? How many people are sitting on the sideline because they don't like adversaries and things happening? I understand. Nobody signs up for it. Nobody wants it. But it's going to happen. It's going to be there. And you got to look for it. You got to be sober and know it's going to happen. Let me keep on going because Paul just writing to this church at Philippi. Let me go. Let me go. The joy, the joy of the local church <laughs> can be experienced when even in the midst of my circumstances, look at this, I make the most of my contact with the loss. <clears throat> that, that, that's good. That, that's good. And it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to spring out. It's going to spring out here in a the, in the second. Look, look at verse 13. Paul says, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. That just looked like he's just saying something, but he's saying something now. Let me, let me give you my point again. The, the joy <clears throat> of the local church can be experienced when in the midst of my circumstances, I make the most of my contact with the laws. <laughs> Paul said the thing that happened to me was for the furtherance of the gospel. What do you mean, Paul? He says that it has become known throughout the entire imperial guard. This is speaking of the palace. This is speaking to literally the commanders, those individuals that were, that were hand-picked to protect the emperor. These were the individuals that were, up, that were appointed to the apostle Paul. The apostle Paul, the, he wasn't in a dungeon as we would think. He's not in a dungeon. No, he's literally, he literally has this about, a, about a thousand or so many theologians suggest, about a thousand or so of these guards and they were literally the, the guards that were handpicked to be able to protect the emperor. And these individuals that were there with the apostle Paul, they just, he wasn't just in a cell somewhere. He just wasn't in a dungeon. But no, they were literally chained together. Literally, according to their custom, according to how they, how they did things, Paul was literally chained to a Roman soldier night and day. He had no privacy when he ate, when he slept, <clears throat> when he wrote, when he prayed, when he preached, had absolutely, positively no privacy. For, so listen to me. He was chained to a guard for 24 hours a day. And according to Roman custom, listen to me real good. Every six hours, they would change shifts. So they had about, he had about four different guards a day. Every six hours, they would change shifts. And they did that to make sure they didn't escape. They did that to make sure they weren't going away. He was literally chained to a Roman guard. And for two years, the Apostle Paul was chained to a guard. But can, can, I, can I tell you, listen, listen to this, because Paul said it's become known. Look at that verse one more time. Let me go back. Back it up again. Give me that verse 13 again. He says, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. The imperial guard is who the apostle Paul was chained to. Or 
was it more appropriately said that the guard was chained to Paul? <laughs> y'all miss, miss it. Because what you think Paul was talking about? If you chain the Paul all day long, what you think he's talking about? He talking about the word. He talking about the gospel. And here it is. He got he got a brand new break. I, I know I know I've been sharing my faith with people before. They didn't want to hear. If you want to see somebody walk away swift, if you want to see somebody do a walk, what's a walk, Pastor? They walk jogging, walk. They walking. Ever seen somebody want to see somebody walk? You say, hey, you know Lord Jesus Christ? And they, they get up out of dollar. They put on they put on their traveling shoes, Lord. God on my traveling shoe. They get up out of there and we want to start. Can I, can I pray with you? Can we touch and agree? They start walking up in that mud. Can I tell you? <laughs> yeah. And now Paul got Paul has a captive audience. <laughs> that don't Paul has somebody he's got to talk to and he's there and the scripture said he would change. Oh, let me go. It's gonna be good, y'all. Look at this Acts chapter 28. This is what this is what this is what's going on during this time. Acts gives us an account. Acts 28, 16 says, And when and when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself. Look at this, with the soldier who guarded him. He was chained to him. He was in a private quarter. He was in a, he was in a, in a private, uh, solitary confinement, but it was still a, a soldier chained there with him. Verse 20 says, for this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you since it has been given, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am what? Wearing this chain. Mm -hmm. Look at it. Verse 30. Here, here's going to bless you. Here it go. He, when he, here you go, look at it. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. So, so Paul, God had graced him. He's, he's, in, he's, he's, he's locked up. He's in prison. But God had graced him the way he was literally kind of like on house arrest. And people could be able to come to him. And he wasn't able to leave, and he still had this, this soldier that was stuck with him all this time. But look at what Paul did all during this time. Paul made the best out of his circumstance. Look at verse 31. I love it, New American Standard. Look what it says. Preaching the kingdom of God. That's what Paul was doing those two years. He locked up with a soldier, four different soldiers a day. People coming to talk to him. People coming, and look what he's doing while he's, while he's locked up. Preaching the kingdom of God. And teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness. I love this word. Let's say this last word together. Unhindered. Look at God. This brother on house arrest. But the scripture says he's doing what God has called him to do. Unhindered. <laughs> oh, miss me. This brother is in circumstances beyond his control. But as we see in the natural, he's locked down. But in the, in the spiritual, God has set him free. Lord, amen. what do you do when your circumstances look like that they have come to cripple you and to hinder you? But really, God is opening up a door for you to flow in an unhindered space. Lord, have mercy. let me read it in New Living. It says boldly, same verse, Acts 28, 31, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. He got a soldier on his hand and the soldier didn't tell him to shh, be quiet. Quiet. The show didn't tell him to shut up, but nobody tried to stop him. He can preach all he want. He can teach all he want. And people coming from everywhere. And Paul is saying, what I'm doing is for the furtherance of the gospel. During this time, Paul was incarcerated. He just wasn't preaching and teaching. He was also writing letters. The letter that we're studying, the book of the book of, book of Philippians, he wrote this letter. He wrote Philippians. He wrote Ephesians. He wrote Colossians. He wrote Philemon. He wrote these prison epistles while he was locked down. But God said, I'm going to use what it is that you're going through to be able to further my call. Ephesians 6 20. Look what the scripture says. For which I am an ambassador in chains. That I might that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul said, I'm, I'm an ambassador in chains. Paul might have, might have, might have, it, it may, it may be to the fact that Paul was more effective in prison than he was going on these missionary journeys. Paul was doing more work, locked down, than he was when he was free. Lord have mercy. Lord, have, I, I'm, I'm looking for all the people who can't do what God called them to do because they Wi-Fi slow. That's all I'm trying to do. I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to talk to somebody right now because, because, because your, your, your rotator cuff uh, is swollen right now. I'm, try, I'm trying to talk to all the folks that can't, <laughs> they can't do what God has called them to do. Oh, because you got this going on and that going on. And we got some legitimate circumstances going on. But Paul is locked down. 
and still preaching in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what he says in, in 2 Timothy 2.9. This is going to bless two people. I know it is. I love this verse. Look what he says. For which I am suffering. Look what Paul says. I'm suffering. Bound with chains. How? As a criminal. Look what he says. But the word of God is not bound. Paul said, I'm locked down. Paul said, I'm in prison. Paul said, I can go and come as I want. I could, I could, they could cut my head off any time. He said, but the word of God is not bound. Come on, let me talk to somebody right now that's in a circumstance, in a dilemma that you don't want to be in. I'm trying to tell you that God is saying, you might be confined to a relationship you don't want to be in right now. You might be confined to circumstances you didn't sign up for. You might be confined to be able not to be able to go and to come the way you want to. Maybe your finances is not what you want to be. Maybe your health is not the way you want to be. But can I tell you that even though you might have limitations, even though you might have things that's in your life that are stopping you as relates to things in the natural. Oh, but God is saying that you got, you're going to hit a plea, you're going to hit a peace and a pocket of grace in your life, the way you're going to be unhindered. Oh God, that's what I'm praying. I'm praying, God, that you let me get into a season of grace unhindered. I don't wear where, no demons, no witches, no warlocks. I don't got to, to wrestle with this and fight with that, but God, I can do what it is you call me to do unhindered. That where finances won't be an issue, unhindered. That where volunteers won't be an issue, unhindered. That where the people will have a mind to work, unhindered. It won't be nothing holding me down. I'm looking for God to allow me to hit a pocket in my life like he did the Apostle Paul. It may not be the way I want it to be. Oh, but I see some progress. Oh, can anybody thank God for some... <sighs> God... I shouldn't be this excited on Thursdays through the word, I guess. Yeah. God help me. Look at this, look at this man of God said. He did such a great job this past Sunday with this. We brought it back, and he'll be here for Sunday, Lord's will. Look what he says. Your place that seems to be incarceration could very well be God's incubation. Remember, remember what we said this Sunday? It had to do with the people of, of, of God being down in Egypt. And I just had to bring it back again today because it makes so much sense because here it's, it's a place of incarceration, but, but it's a place of incubation. God is using him in the middle of his circumstances. Ooh, and Paul is preaching to the gods, the imperial gods, the, the gods to the emperor, and he's converting them to the kingdom. How do you know that, Pastor? Because look how Paul closes this same letter. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Y'all missed it. He, he, all the saints greet you. He's saying that some of these gods are saints now. And he's telling them, you know what? We got some of them saved too, boy. You know what? These people that they hooked me up with, we got some of them on the Lord's side. This brother is working. Let me roll out of here. Philippians 1.13 says, and to all the rest of that, he said, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. This, this is good. This is good. I, I could have stopped here, but I didn't stop here. I just, I'm just going to give you the, the, the principle that I see here. Because the Apostle Paul was locked down. <clears throat> he was in prison. And it's amazing how God is allowing his success to be his revenge. See, 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 because folk thank Paul in prison because of this and because of that. Because he did this and he did that. Because of, that, because of this. Isn't it amazing when somebody sees you going through something, they love to start deducing what happened to you in your life or what's going on. But here, Paul said, no, folk know that I'm in prison for Christ. I'm not here because I stole nothing. I'm not here because I, 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 I was an insurrection. I didn't do nothing because I broke the law. He said, I'm here for, for Christ. And the only point I'm trying to make here is that you don't have to fight your battle. You don't got to go and try to chase people down. And whenever you try to chase down rumors and chase down what somebody said about you you're only making it worse oh I love what Bishop Jones used to say whenever somebody throw mud on you he said don't try to wipe the mud off because when you try to wipe the mud off you're going to smear it on your clothes let the mud dry and don't worry don't chase it don't bother but when the mud dry just hit them with the shoulders just, just, just brush it off just don't, let, don't, don't sit there and try to well let me tell you what happened well I know you heard about this and I know you heard about that but let me give you my side of the story let me tell you what really happened you start doing that you look guilty and you make things word. Let God fight your battle. Let the Lord take care of you. I don't got to try to chase you down. I'm going to let you think whatever the devil you want to think and I'm going to keep on serving God. Alrighty then. That was free. I could have gave you a point but I spared you. I could have said, said the joy of the local church right there just as easy as I have the last six or six times but I spared you that time. But here's another one. The joy of the local church can be experienced through knowing 
that the way I handle my hardships can help or hinder the body. I got to speed up or I'm just going to stop. Speed up or stop. I wanted to do. Look, the Jordan local church can be experienced <clears throat> through knowing that the way I handle my hardships, I already touched this a little bit earlier, but now let me lean on a little bit more. It can help or hinder the body. You don't believe it. Look at verse 14. He said, the thing that happened to me, man, that happened for the first of the gospel, the thing that happened to me, Lucas says, and most of the brothers, <laughs> look at Paul, so he's, so, he's so strategic. He said, most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, I'm much more bold to speak the word without fear. You missed it. Paul, Paul said the fact that I'm going through what I'm going through and I've handled it the right way. It has emboldened other folk to be able to do what they need to do. In other words, they're saying if Paul is in prison and he's still writing letters. If Paul is in prison, he's still preaching. If Paul is in prison and he's still doing the work of the Lord, I'm around here free and I'm not doing nothing. Paul is saying to him when we look at his circumstances, the way I handle my circumstances, it can either help or hinder the body. And I got to ask myself a question. What, what am I doing through my circumstances? It, can someone look at my life? I don't get the glory and the honor, but Jesus did say in Matthew 5, I'm going to let my light so shine that where we can be, be able to give him glory and honor, where people can look at us and see that we're giving him glory and honor. Let me keep on going. The joy, y'all, is this good, y'all? Are y'all okay? Y'all good? The, 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 joy, the joy that should be in the local church can be extinguished when I am blindsided by the fact that some people are motivated to depreciate others. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. I ain't going to be able to do it. I got to go, though. Look. It can be extinguished. This could, this, could, this could knock the wind out of you. When you come into the family of God, you come into the faith. Come on. And this is, again, this is not about a gathering. It's about, it's about us being the body of Christ. It's about us being believers. But when you come into the body of Christ and you find out that there are people that are a part of the body or supposed to be a part of the church. And their only motivation <clears throat> is to try to depreciate people. And more importantly, try to depreciate you. That can extinguish your joy. This is where people start saying stuff like this. I don't got to go to church. I don't do church people. I love it when people say, I don't want to go to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites there. And I say, oh, man, we got room, plenty of room for one more. <laughs> it's plenty of room. All them hypocrites. We got plenty of room. We got plenty of room. We got, we got, we got room. Come on, we got plenty of room. You're right. We, we're trying to get our act together. Oh, but look what Paul said. Paul said, did you, did you notice what he said in verse 14? He said, and most of the brothers, the brothers, they were confident and they were bold. But look what he said in verse 15. Some indeed preached Christ from envy. Paul says, Paul says, in one, on one side, one side of the coin, there are people that saw my imprisonment and it caused them to be bold for the things of God. It caused them to rise up and do something. The fact that Paul is going through the way he's going through and he's still maintaining his joy, he's still pushing, it emboldened them. But he said, on the other side of the coin, there are brothers that are preaching from envy. They only want to try to depreciate my value. What do you mean by depreciate, brother pastor? So glad you asked. It means to reduce a value. Look at some of the synonyms. It means to cheapen or to decay or to devalorize, to de 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 devaluate. I didn't even know devaluate was a word, but I'm adding it to the repertoire. To devalue, to downgrade, to lower, to mark down, to soften, to underprize, to underrate, to undervalue, to write down, to write off. Is there anybody watching me right now that there's some people in your life that fit one of these words? They do everything they try. They do everything they can to try to cheapen who you are. They try to down talk and they try to say the only reason why people We've been doing it to me my entire, all my life I had to fight. Come on here. And I say, we've been doing it to me all my, all my life. When I got called in the ministry, oh, you just want to preach because this person is preaching. You're just trying to sound like this person. You're just trying to do like, oh, my, oh, I've always been the underdog. I've always, when we started this ministry, you just doing this for this. Or you just trying to do it. People always just try to undervalue you. Or they, they'll say stuff like this. They say, I'm going to give me some lights like Kobe. Because that's how, that's how his church growing. Because Kobe got them lights. He got that stage. And people know I'm not telling them. He got that stage. And he got this. Stuff. I'm going to give me some light. As if, as if the God, you, it's, it's so hard for you to say the hand of the Lord is on the ministry. It's so hard for you to say that God is 
we have to, we have to deduce us down to some lights. Anybody thinking about no lights, no camera, no action? Come on here. The hand of God. Oh, but don't leave it on me. I'm just trying to show you that people do this all the time. Come on, you start your business. You got you buy your house. You got a car. You do all this. Oh, you just doing this because of that. Oh, they try to knock you down. Oh, who you think you are? You going back to school again? What you trying to do? You trying to do this? And it's not the sinners that's doing it. It's church folk. Come on, nobody here but us. Can I say this? And y'all, y'all, y'all be here. Y'all come back Sunday. Can I say this? I can't stand church people. I love kingdom people. Oh, there's a difference. People can come and sign their name on the road, and them, them church people just come, just come, just to come to church. No, but but kingdom people, y'all, y'all, y'all go. I'm gonna preach that one day from the topic. I can't stand you church people. Can I tell you here? I'm talking about folk. I'm just, <coughs> oh, Jesus, I'm talking about folk that just. Just go through the motion. Just people that's just religious at best. They just come and hear, oh, that was a good word, but don't apply it to their life. That's church people. Church people is just come just see who got who got what on and they go out in the parking lot and talk about it. That's church people. Church people just child, let me tell you. That's church people. But kingdom people say, let's pray for them. Kingdom people say, I didn't even see it. I was so engulfed in worship, I didn't know what was going on. Kingdom people say, that was my word. Church people say, oh, he's still preaching. There's a, there's a difference. There's a difference. But there are people that try to de- <laughs> they try to try to depreciate. Look at where Paul is. I got I got to hurry. People were talking about Paul saying Paul had, had sin. They say Paul, if he was such a great man of God, he wouldn't be in the situation he was in. If he was such a great man of God, he wouldn't he he must be compromising. Come on, this is what the entire, almost the entire book of, of 1 Corinthians is about, that Paul is countering what all those little super apostles were saying. Paul is countering what they were saying. He had all these other people coming around telling them about the apostle Paul, and they were listening to what they were saying. And Paul said, am I not an apostle to you? If I'm not an apostle to anybody else, I'm not an apostle to you. And so Paul's character was being attacked. Again, they were devaluing him. And if we don't learn how to know that there are people supposedly in the body of Christ that want to devalue us and say, who you just trying to do this because of that and you just trying to do this and here and what you got on and what you doing and all that just nitpicking, just nitpicking your life. Lord have mercy. I love what Babe Ruth said. Babe Ruth said that the loudest boos come from the cheapest seats. So, and I tell you, the, the people that, that, that boo, it come from, the, it come from the cheapest seat. And here you cannot allow yourself to stop just because people are criticizing you. Let me keep on going. Y'all don't like that. That's fine, though. But Paul said, Paul said folk preaching because of envy. They jealous of Paul. We talked about jealousy in, uh, in, in, in detail on Sunday, so I'm not getting back into that. Paul said they envious. They're jealous of me. They're jealous of what I'm doing. They're jealous of the work of God, and they're trying to devalue me. But Paul said, don't listen to them. The joy that should be, come on, let's go again. The joy that should be in the local church can be extinguished when I am blindsided by the fact that there will be conflict in the body. Be conflict in the body. That, that sounds elementary, my dear Watson, but as a baby Christian, you don't think, you don't think, you don't think that church people are going to do you like that. As a baby Christian, you come and you think everybody loves the Lord. <clears throat> I remember them telling me 20 years ago, I remember them saying, all Israel ain't Israel. I couldn't figure that thing out. What you mean all Israel ain't Israel? In other words, just because they come to church... <laughs> <clears throat> that don't mean they're in the church. Come on. That's because somebody sitting on your row. That's because somebody in your ministry with you. That's because somebody preaching to you, teaching to you, singing to you. Come on here. It doesn't matter because the person you see them up doing what they're doing. That don't mean that they're part of the, of the family of God. And that blindsides you if you're not ready for that when you come to the kingdom of God. And that's why many people run away from the house of God. Here Paul said they're preaching because of envy. Verse 15 again, he says they're preaching and, and rivalry. What, what is rivalry? What does this mean? Strife, <clears throat> conflict, bitter conflict, heated, often violent d- dissension. This is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that they're fighting against me, vehemently coming after me. And you got to know every now and then that's what's going to happen. You're going to be in ministry. And it's not going to come from the person at the club. It's not going to be the person at the party. It's going to be the person that you just, just got done saying, I love the Lord, our heart, my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Be the same person that's broken and crying and running and leaping and dancing and be the same one trying to tear you down. Amen. 
<laughs> I'm trying to tell you that this is this is this is how we fight our battle. This is this called this, this kingdom of God. That's how it goes. Let me keep on going. This is not good news, I guess. But look, let me keep on going. The joy of the local church. I guess I am gonna get done. Look, but 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 don't don't come on. No, don't, don't get nervous, y'all. Don't don't squirt. Y'all know this is the truth. That there's gonna be conflict in the body. But I love Paul because he brings so much balance. The joy of the local church can be experienced when I keep my mind. When I keep in my mind that everyone is not against me. People will be envious in the, in the body. People are going to be envious. There are going to be people that's masquerading as if they're part of the body. And they're going to be wanting to fight. They're going to be talking about people. They're going to be destroying. They're going to be doing all that. But Paul comes right back and says, everybody not against me. And see, this is why we got to push back. And this is why I say, here comes the church. Because everybody not treacherous, everybody not mean, everybody, all preachers aren't pimps. Come on, all people are not manipulative. Everybody in the house of God are not hypocrites. There's some people that are not against me. There are some people that genuinely love. That's what Paul said. Look at verse 15. He said, but others, what? From goodwill. And some other people that's goodwill. They're, they're delightful. They have good intentions. Verse 16. He said, the latter do it out of what? Out of love. He said, there's some folk that genuinely love. There's some people that have some good will, some good intentions. Everybody is not bad in the church. Come on, somebody. Everybody's not to the point where they're trying to tear people down. There are some people that are not against me. They're literally for me. And I can't allow a couple of mean, mean people to make me be able to lump all believers in the same bag. I cannot allow the fact that I've been hurt or dropped in the previous ministry not for me to allow myself to trust somebody else. I cannot allow the fact that I know something or saw something or heard something to make me clump everybody in the same bag and say, them church people. But no, I got to know that this is, this is, this is what's going on. It, let, me, let, me, let me finish. Can I finish this, y'all? Can I finish? Y'all okay? Y'all okay? I'm out of time, though. I'm out of time. Let me, let me give you this, though. Verse 16. Look what it says. Knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Y'all miss it. Y'all miss how good that is. But Paul says... I got people against me. I got people talking about me. I got people trying to devalue me. I got people trying to say that I'm going through what I'm going through because I'm a heretic, because I'm a liar, because I'm a hypocrite and all this. But I got people who love me. I got people who are for me. And Paul says, that's fine. I'm here. I'm put as, as, as in the defense of the gospel. In other words, Paul says, I'm a soldier on duty. That's what Paul is saying. Paul said, we're in a war. Paul is saying, and when you're in a war, you're going to have people fighting with you, and you're going to have an enemy that's fighting against you. Paul understands that this is an army. We are a soldier in the army. Look what he says in 2 Timothy 2, 3. He says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We're, we're, we're in the army. There's going to be casualties of war. There's going to be people that come, people that go, people that tear us down. But we are in the army of the Lord. Verse 4, war. look at it says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who has enlisted him. My aim is not to get caught up in all the he says, she says stuff. Not to get into the, the get into, caught up in the weeds with all this other foolishness. But my responsibility, the one who put me in the army, I'm going to do what it is he called me to do. And I got to fight a good fight of faith. I got to finish my course. I got to do what he needs, what he called me to do. Look at this. Look at this. Come on, look at it. Come on, write it down. The joy that, could, that, that should be in the local church can be extinguished when I'm blindsided by the fact that everyone in the church, everyone in the church has pure motives. If I think that everybody in the church has pure motives, I'm going to be deceived. Do I, if I, and, I, and notice I'm saying the church. <laughs> because there are people, again, that are joining the church or part of a ministry that they're not, they're, they're not in Christ. There are people that are on roles <laughs> across the world, church roles. But they never put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not believers. There are some people that's going to take the church bus to hell. You don't believe me. Y'all think I'm just trying to be funny. I'm trying. Matthew 7, Jesus said, in that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't I not prophesy? Didn't I not teach? Didn't I not preach? Didn't I say, depart from me? I never knew you. You signed up on the roll, but you never signed up with me. And so there are people that are masquerading as the people of God or the church. They have impure motives. Verse 17, look what he says. He says, the former proclaim, proclaim Christ out of selfish motives. That's self, and selfish ambition. They're just trying to get paid. 
They're just trying to their own personal success. There are people that, that's a part that's that's attached to the body of Christ. They're only trying to get something from people. They're only trying to pimp people. There are those individuals, but everybody's not like that. But if we don't understand that and don't know that that's present, that that's present, and that could be prevalent, we're gonna get the wind knocked out of us. We got to know that it's out there and know that everybody's not like that. The joy that should be in the local church can be extinguished when I am blindsided by the fact that everyone in the church, look at this, is not trying to help the body. Everybody in the church is not trying to help the body of Christ. There are some people, just as fast, just as, fast as we win in the souls, they're running them off. <laughs> look what he says in verse 17. Not sincerely. Look, at it, look what he says. He's talking about the people in the, that's attached to the kingdom. That's attached to the, to the assembly. <laughs> not, sin, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Paul said, I'm already in prison. But they want to add bonds on top of my bonds. They want to add pr- pain on top of my pain. Everybody that names the name of Christ is not trying to help the body of Christ. We got to know that. We won't be blindsided. We, our joy won't be extinguished. I wish somebody would have told me this when I first came in. Because when, when I started seeing people lying and talking about each other and all this kind of stuff, I was like, my God, what's going on here? I thought everybody liked each other. I thought we was, I thought we was good. I thought we was okay. I thought we, I thought we loved the same God. I thought we let all that stuff go. I, that, that not the win out of me. I'm by myself, I guess. When I came in, I'm a baby Christian. I'm, I'm here to serve the Lord till I die. And I see all this stuff. I'm like, oh, my God, what's going on? We can do that. Come on here. We can, that's okay. That's all right. We, we, we can do that. <laughs> we got to know that it's there. That's not, that's not our standard. Paul said they're going to be coming up among us. Read when we get a chance. Acts 20, 29. Let me get out of here. Acts 20, 29 says they're going, to be, they're going to be grievous wolves that come where at? Among us. Not sparing the flock. I love it. He's done. He's done and I'm done. Verse 18. Paul says all the stuff that's going on. Paul said, what then? <laughs> Paul said, there are people that, that, that's for me. I'm in prison. I don't like my circumstances. I don't like what I'm going through. My, my natural circumstances, I wish I could change them, but I can't. But Paul said, I make the best out of my circumstances. Because I'm in this circumstances, there are people that are doing me good, and there are some people that are doing me bad. But then he, I love how he says in verse 18, he said, what then? In other words, you want to know what Paul's saying? So what? That's what he said. Paul said, So what? <laughs> He says, so what? I I love it. I I can't help but think of Psalm 107 and 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, so? Oh, come on. That's what a mature believer ought to do. Oh, there's people, there's hypocrites in the church. So? Come on. There's some some pastors that's trying to get your money. So? There's some individuals, they talking about me. They lying on me. They this and that. So? That's all we ought to be. So what? Just as there's bad, then there's good. Just as there's defective, there's effective. Just like you have, just come on. There there are people in the body of Christ that's doing what they need to do. And I believe I got a group of people that are here and a group of people that are watching me that are doing what they need to do in the kingdom of God. We don't care what's going on out there. We don't care what this person did, what that person did. We're going to continue to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So goodbye, truth and love. Let me let y'all alone. Here, let me tell you this last thing. The joy of the local church can be experienced when I learn not to worry about what I cannot control and focus on what is in my control. I can't worry about what I can't control, but I am to focus on what I can control. I can't stop people from lying. I can't stop people from being messy. I can't stop people from being petty. I can't stop people from gossiping, but I can control myself from lying, from being petty, from being messy. I can control myself. I don't got nothing to do with nobody else is doing. I'm here with Jesus. I'm here to serve Jesus. I'm here to lift him up. And Paul says in verse 18, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is being proclaimed. He said, I don't care why they doing it and how they doing it. As long as Jesus being exalted. And the end of it said, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. In other words, Paul said, I still got my joy. I don't care why they doing it, how they doing it. I don't care what's going on. I still got my joy. Is there anybody in here that still got their joy? Come on, put your hands together. Give God some praise. On behalf of everyone at Truth and Love Ministries, we want to thank you for joining us for our virtual worship experience. 
We want to thank you for your likes and your shares, your comments and your emojis. But we also want to invite you to partner with us as we continue to be the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. You do know that he told us that we ought to feed the hungry, we ought to clothe the naked, and we ought to be the church. And you can help us to continue to do just that through your generosity. And there are three easy, safe, and secure ways that you can do just that. You can text the word T-I-L Jax, one word, T-I-L Jax, to the number 77977. You can go to our website, www.truthandlove.tv, or you can go to the Apple Store or the Google Play Store, search for Truth and Love Jax, download our app, and you can give that way. We thank you for your participation. We thank you for your generosity, and we love you, and we'll see you next time. Here comes the church. God bless you.